I guess record, and the rather lengthy, because he didn't walk to all kinds of records. You know. But he was a, he lost an arm, and he was later a postmaster in Clinton. So I've been looking, I've been looking through our records, trying to find a picture of a postmaster with one arm. I haven't been able to make luck yet. He's, he was also a town school class one time. But um, another fellow I got a little bit. Another guy, Frank Tarrant, the 121st Regiment. He's a uh, relative of Mel Edwards, a guy who didn't desert. He was wounded in battle, and the record, the letters there are very, very emotional. He was wounded in battle, and he was sent to a hospital, and his mother came down to see him. His mother came down from, uh, from up north, Cedar Falls, and it's up in the She came down to see him in Virginia, and uh, he died. He died in the hospital. Here's a, you know, this is a sad image of his mother going down, this your son, he dies. And then the correspondent was down with some other letters from friends and stuff. And it's, it's really neat. But from all these letters and artifacts, I'm trying to, and newspapers, trying to reconstruct you know, all the feelings of the Civil War. Um, you know, the Civil War soldiers live for their mail, I see. Time and again in the letters, they keep talking about it. I haven't heard from a home. I haven't heard from you. I haven't heard from you. I got a lot of it. It's always the first letter, first line of the letter about me. I haven't got a letter from you lately. And they were just, you know, they were really, when they got mail, they were happy. Didn't get mail anymore, just like anybody else. You know, even more so then. Um, you know, it was so important that stamps became almost like currency. They would swap stamps, and stamps became very valuable. Um, much like you know, in World War II, I, I read cigarettes were come out of you could swap. The Civil War was, was stamps. Stamps became the thing. They get wet, damp, and stuff in your pocket, but they would still be. With gold. Um, and papers were also, newspapers were also a treasure. In the Clinton Courier, uh, I've been to the Clinton Courier for about 1863, and I broke the film machine and the tape up in the old house, so I, I am in trouble. Because they're going to have to that there's a guy named Charles Butts from Clinton, who's in the 121st, and he wrote, he wrote to the paper in uh, October 1862. I'll just quote here. Um, he refers to the paper. A friend kindly sent me a copy of the Clinton Courier the other day. I followed it up with another. It seemed like the face of an old friend, an absent friend. Unexpectedly returned to greet me. We get a few northern newspapers that we are accustomed to see. The near peril is seen every day. The semi occasion of the year is peril. But the local news and the columns of the Clinton Courier is more interesting. And Lieutenant Stewart, also, he, these guys all wrote to the Clinton Courier, both the Greece, they all kind of real good letters to the editor of, uh, you know, they, they'd write home, maybe the whole letter be published, or they'd write to the editor, or, it was quite interesting. On December 24th, 1862, uh, Captain Stewart wrote to the Courier about, about the Courier. I often see the Courier, and although the camp is flooded with papers of various kinds, there are none more welcome, because there are none which speak to us in the sweet language of home, but here. Clint, perilous Clint, <laughs> is thus brought at once into our scanty shelter tents, and as our eyes run over the column in search of home news, the hearts will throb with a quickness, and the eye glance with restless earnestness for something which may interest us. So they like the Clint Courier. Um, so, so I had all these documents. I'm trying to put them together in some kind of semblance of order here. Uh, you know, early on, in, in the Civil War started. Early in the book of the Clinton period, 1861, we talked about after Fort Sumter, Clinton was just manifest <laughs> manifestations of loyalty and patriotism of the good people of this vicinity are not one. Flags floated everywhere. Union cockades and rosettes bespangle the bosoms of the fair and brave and unite all to the Union and Constitution. So they were pretty excited about this war, but it was still early. Uh, never was ready to go away to the war. There was a recruiting office set up on the Village Green. Uh, A.S. Taylor's saloon in the Nalton block. This happened to put the recruiting office in the saloon. It was convenient. <laughs> Um, I guess this is a couple doors up from the Clinton House, the old Clinton 
off the restaurant with me where the bookstore is. So a few doors up from, from there. Um, this A.S. Taylor was a lieutenant of the militia. The militia was like a social group. It was like a good old boys that hung around, and maybe on 4th of July they'd come march out of the and have a couple of beers and go home, you know? So it was a, and now they could really struck their feathers. Now they could get out and do something. So they, they started, they, they opened up the recruiting. And we got a neat poster over here, a recruiting poster, and it's, it's real interesting, I think. It's uh, entitled the Grinnell Light Infantry. And I get, I just got a lot of this stuff, I just, it speaks for itself. I'll pull it, I'll read this poster to you. Who would not want to work for Uncle Sam, who gives a nice farm and $100? In gold at the close of the war. $13 a month. $350 for clothing. Medical medical attention. Free of charge. <laughs> 75 men wanted to join the regiment being formed at Utica and Rome by Brigadier H.R. White. I have no idea who H.R. White is. I tried to track this guy down. I don't know. I don't know who he is. They got Roger with the Rome Arsenal, which is a bully place. Quarters. First come, first serve. And they had two, they had two guys that were gonna highlight that on the marquee. They had uh, Porter J. Homer was a captain. He had experience in the 53rd Regiment. And Charlie Brown, first lieutenant. And Charlie Brown had just returned from Colonel McQuaid's 14th Regiment, and who has seen considerable fun and some service on the Potomac and will warrant the boys good rations, good care, good clothes, and sure pay. Now is the time to enlist. <clears throat> we're going to pay it to the day of enlistment. That was one door north of the Clinton House. That was November 25th, 1864. That was before any, anything really happened. It was before the full run of that occurred that year. But there was nothing else that was really drastic. So we were going along fine. It was no big deal. Um, but in Clinton, we had a couple of units with the Seymour Artillery. And this, this is one of these militia social organizations. Um, they got all anxious and they had a big meeting and elect new officers and so they were they were starting to come. There also was a group called the Utica Citizen Corps, which was a military unit that started 18, uh, early, early 19th century and lasted up until World War II, I believe. Walt Cookenhans was a member of the Utica Citizen Corps. But there was a local Utica militia. It was, this is the flower of men from Utica. And they immediately went to, went to Albany, became the 14th New York volunteer. And the first man from Clinton to leave with them was a guy named Thomas J. Sawyer. And he went away to Albany to serve the 14th and then on down. Um, at the same time, Clinton was known for its uh, grist mills. And down in Dugway, there were some mills and stuff. And there was a group down there that started to kind of Thomas Healy started a regiment called the Farmers Rifles, the Farmers Independent Rifles. With 21 of his employees, and he formed a regiment down there, a country. Um, and he got to some local tailors, George Burwell and Howard Ives. They ran a store in the Mannering Block. Um, again, next to the Clinton House. Look, everything happened at the Clinton House. You could join, you could uniform, you could beer, you could <laughs> So they designed uniforms for these, these guys. Again, from the Clinton Courier, uh, Messrs. Ives and Burwell are getting up a new and very neat uniform for the farmer's independent rifles. The coat is black with red and blue trimmings. The pants are light blue with red stripes. The officer's coats are neatly trimmed with gilded and gold. It is with all a very pretty suit and a credit to the spirit and enterprise of the rifles. So they were they were going to do something. I'm not sure what, but they were, they were forming up. They, they seemed to hang around a long time. They formed the unit up, and there was an article in the letter to the editor of the Courier saying, okay, Mr. Healy, you got your regiment, now what are going to do? They were kind of tired. They had contests, shooting contests, and all that stuff. And they were having a great time down in Dugway, but <coughs> now what? And the Captain Healy wrote back to the Courier, kind of defending himself. and said, I'm going to call so you. Come, give me a break. Uh, we'll go. And he did, finally. Um, he did. He finally went off and joined the 8th Cavalry out of Rochester and, and, uh, and served and served the war and came home. And just as soon as they were looking at the courier, and there was a little advertisement that, that Colonel Bailey was back from the front, he was going to open his grist mill again. So in 1863, he returned, went back to his farm. That was it. So he didn't serve. 
Um, Hamilton College started a unit uh, under James Stewart. His, these names keep popping up. James Stewart formed a unit um, at Clinton College. They drilled every night. And they studied the science of war. Uh, they, made a, they made a banner with the hung from the chapel. So they were they were doing their thing. Actually, later that same in the same period, the students made an effigy of uh, Jefferson Davis up on the campus, and they burned it, and they strung it across the college hill, and uh, they had quite a meeting, and they cheered, and they burned Jeff Davis. Uh, also, the Clinton Liberal Institute created a unit uh, called the Skinner's Guards, um, and they they made great proficiency in military tactics had given several street drills and parades, and uh, so they had a good time. The other day I was looking at our collection, I found some pictures of uh, some fellows in uniform. And uh, this might be after the Civil War, but I think it's still representative. One says Edward B. Stanley, uh, uniform at the Clinton Grammar School. This is post-Civil War, but these are up here. And uh, I don't know what these guys did, but they, they had fun. Um, at the same time, they started a unit called the 26th New York Volunteer Regiment. Um, Company F was formed in Whitestown, and they marched through Clinton one day, and they were called the Kirkland Volunteers. Uh, it says here, again, I, I got a quote from it for it, it's written so well. The first company of volunteers from this township for the support and vindication of the national flag, left this village on Thursday afternoon. The military companies turned out, that's the Seymour's and the, all the other guys that kind of hang out, uh, and the Clinton Coronet Band. They marched around the park while well, the Seymour Guard squad fired salvos of artillery. The volunteers were received with a salute from the military when the company formed, and they're preceded by a large number of citizens marched down Utica Street as far as Mr. J.D. Elliott's, where after a parting salute and a goodbye and God bless you from all present, they're with their banners of the breeze, their last bazaars died away in the distance. <laughs> so, and I also got a picture here someplace, I think it's over here, of a band from that period. They keep talking about this Clinton Cornet band. Every time there's a meeting, every time there's any kind of thing, a Clinton Cornet band is there. And there's a picture up here, I'm not sure what era, it may be a post of war, but you get a feel what this band must have looked like. Um, every meeting, every patriotic meeting, and all this ends up with the Cornet band is there. So interesting. But the units of the 26 continue to be formed up. And on uh, May 10th, a company of volunteers from Waterville in the vicinity passed through, commanded by Captain Palmer, another fellow from Clinton. Um, he would later command Company E, the 26th. And uh, this was the, the regiment that uh, my favorite person would serve in as William E. Owen. And uh, the Clinton Courier said, a company of volunteers from Waterville under the command of Captain Palmer passed through here on Friday the last with drums beating, cannons roaring, and colors flying. They're a very fine looking company. I think my William Bowen probably was in that march to Clinton. And that's, that's my main goal of life now, is to find out about this guy, William Bowen. Much to the chagrin of my wife, kids. <laughs> um, but William, we have letters over here, 54 letters of this guy, William Bowen. And uh, the more I find out about this guy, it's just unbelievable. He was born in England, Canberra, England, 1841. His family moved, moved here in the age of three, he settled in, in uh, South Trent. Family was farm. I believe the family was farmers. I gotta, I gotta get all of the census reports one of these days and check all that out. But, but um, and we have 54 letters here, <coughs> and, uh, and I, I have to just, they're well written. They start off being written like a kid at camp. And as they go on, they get real refined and they really develop this writing style. I think it's funny. The very first letter was written from Washington D.C. and. Uh, the stationery is great. The stationery shows a picture of the Capitol. And uh, again, the, the, uh, they're called Sutters. The guys, the Sutters are the guys who sold things to the soldiers. They had a little wagon and go around and you know, take the poor money, poor soldiers' money, and sell all those high-priced goods. And they sold the stationery. So some of the stationery is really interesting. 
This one is, I got a picture of it, I'll show you. But here's the first letter. Now imagine you're a mother, and you wonder where your son is, and you get a letter to him. Washington, D.C. Having a few spare moments to spare, I thought I'd write a few lines to let you know where I was. I suppose you wondered where I was. I started Monday morning for Utica when I enlisted to serve my country. So I started forward to do the same. This is how we wrote it. I thought he would not like it, so I thought I would not come home. We went to Elmira. We were mustered into the United States service for three months and two years in the state service. Our food is pretty good. We have eggs, buttered potatoes, ham, rice, sometimes milk. We have some, we've had some good rides. We have some good rides when we came here. Punctuation is not great. You may expect me home about the 1st of September, as out of time is out the 21st of August. We say it's only out for three months. Um, I would have swore you sent me a dollar, but I have not had it. I have money plenty now, so we have been paid. We are now in Washington and expect to stay here some time. I've been to the President's house, to the Capitol, to the Navy Yard, to the Pat office, where I've seen Washington's sword. So you're a mother and you get a letter that says, hey, I joined the Army and gone for three months. And he was very certain it would only be three months. This is for three months in the state service. Well, what happened was that uh, very shortly after, uh, there was some confusion about how long he was going to be in the service. Nah, it's not really three months. It's going to be three years. <laughs> it was very politely federalized, and he ended up to be in three years. Um, in some regiments, this created quite a problem. These guys, there was a lot of confusion. If you look at some of the records, even the officers were confused. But they got these guys in, and well, these are three-month guys, three-year guys, two-year guys, I don't know. So finally, it turned out that the, we were going to be three years. And the 14th Regiment actually had a mutiny. And some guys were put in this mutiny. Um, one of these guys is Thomas Sawyer, who, as I mentioned, was the first guy to leave. Um, it seems like when they told him they were going to be there for a longer time, they all assembled on the break ground and made some ruckus. And uh, it was quickly broken up by the colonel of the regiment. And also a fellow by the name of General Sherman marched on the break ground with cannons and quickly uh, broke the mutiny up. And uh, things went on. But uh, it was a mutiny. It, it, it's interesting how, uh, again, I'm sorry, what's the courier just explains this mutiny. And uh, it was no big deal, he said. It wasn't real. They just got in town and agreed. And so Bowen's letters go on, you know. He talks about the end of the Battle of Bull Run. And the letters are interesting. The second letter he wrote back, um, I was not at the Battle of Bull Run. I was within seven miles of the rebels. Uh, the rebels are dying off like rotten sheep. Well, it wasn't quite the, what really happened in the Bull Run. It was quite the contrary. I expect to be in the next fight which will be in a few days. We have plenty of clothes. I have two pairs of pants, two, two pairs of drawers, two pairs of socks, two jackets, towels. It's pretty hard to keep clean. I suppose you think I'm coming home after three months, but not so. You have to stay for, it's two years, excuse me. You have to stay for two years, or until the war, or until after the war. Some think the war will be settled before that time. If I get a furlough, I shall come home. <coughs> So he goes on to talk about how much he gets paid and uh, how he isn't paid or sleeping in the tents. Um, he got $13 a month, and then he stopped out of money for uh, $2 taken off, uh, held back. So they held $2 off, but they're going to pay him when he gets out of the army to kind of keep it for him, for savings. And there was a couple of folks that's taken off the soldier's home, there's clothing allowance, he ended up with like $10 a month. And then the guy sent the money home. He talks about sending the money home to his mother and father. Um, so he missed, he missed the bull run. And after, then after the bull run, you see a change in the letters. It became more of a serious war. And he saw that they weren't going to be over in 90 days. Um, and the next, one of the other letters going on in December of 1861, he writes home again. I received your kind letter tonight, and very glad to hear you are all well. I am well as ever, and feel first rate. It's very fine weather here. There's no snow. It's very cold. The boys tell me I'm getting too fat for a soldier. I do not think so. I do weigh 
hours more now than I was when I was home. He said, I'm very sorry to hear that so many of my friends are dead, but it could not be helped. I have not gotten any letters from Thomas, that's his brother, as you said. And he wrote me, you want to write a letter to Mrs. Jones. And tell him, Mrs. Jones. Of course, if you're talking about Trenton, South Trenton, there's so many wealth people there, so many people named Jones. Um, I cannot be with you this Christmas or New Year's, but I hope I'll will have a first rate time at home. I shall have my Christmas in camp, but I hope that if I live, I shall be with you next time. So no more at present from William Warren. Um, you know, letters are full of a lot of these letters that I wrote, if I live. If I live, I'll come home. Or they talk about cannot be helped. It's not been a feeling of desperateness. You know, it's, it's, I don't know if I'm gonna, I don't know if I'm gonna live to be home, but if I do live, I'll come see you. And then that's through, through these letters, all the other letters, that same depression. But the Clinton Curry described the first Christmas in the army. Um, and again, the, the courier, uh, some kind of correspondent, I think it was the 26th. Christmas was a great day here. It was a lovely day. The sun rose bright and beautiful. Kindly, gentle rays bringing warmth and comfort. Um, the high point of their Christmas was the colonel's wife raising the flag in the camp. That must have been a wild time. Uh, but the, the troops were served a great feast of oysters and turkey. Singing the music were the orders of the day. Oysters seemed to be really popular. You hear about oysters. And uh, even in the GDR movements, every time they got together, they're going to have, they call them camp fighters. They're going to have oysters and coffee. And they're going, oh, <laughs> But um, these guys had oysters and turkey. And, um, but the uh, correspondent of the courier said, I should very much like to spend New Year's in Clinton. But I cannot. I must be content with wishing it, wishing it maybe a happy new year to all. I trust another New Year's Day will see the war ended and we all spend it at home. So that was that was his first his first Christmas. And he was thinking, now we're thinking about well, next year, it'll be all over. But it went on and on. Um, so so Bowen was was in I think the summer of 1862, the letters get real. No grim. Uh, he was in Antietam, he was in Bull Run, he was in Cedar Mountain, he was in South Mountain, all these battles in Virginia in the summer. It was a horrible summer. Uh, it was a tough time. And the letters certainly reflect it. He, he was very specific about the battle and actually where he was and who was doing what. And it's, it's amazing. He must have an inside track or something. Even just as he talked about marching here and there, and I checked up on the map, he's right on the mileage. But, uh, June of 1862, he wrote that they finally saw their first rebels. He says, uh, we've taken a good many prisoners since we came here. They're a tough set of dirty men, ragged, they wear gray uniforms. Richmond is not taken. We will have it in a few days. This was all in the hand to Richmond. It's always the whole thing. They just get Richmond to war, we also they spent three years trying to get Richmond. Um, very descriptive. A letter in January and July 1st, 1862. Um, I received your kind letter this afternoon. Was glad to hear from you, and from home to learn you are all well and in good spirits at present. Hope that when you get these few lines, you may continue to be so. I do not want mother or father to worry for me, nor uncle or aunt, for it does no good. When I enlisted for a soldier, I expected the fare as a soldier. I know I should see some hard times, but I do not complain. But it's no use. I see some tough times, and that is, but that is not anything. We have gone we have gone two days without any bread. You cannot get anything but a little coffee, and to march through mud and rain, wade brooks, and at night sleep on the wet ground and cover with a wet blanket. That is some of what I have seen and gone through. That is not half nor a quarter of our times. We have had some good times, plenty to eat and drink, nothing to do. It is getting very hot here, but a soldier must stand all such things. It is no use to grumble, for it does no good. I stand it well, am 
have as a pair BEAR. It can stand almost anything a soldier's life for me. So there, and he goes on to say, the room is very healthy, but there is not more than eight or ten in the whole regiment set. I get, you know, when you get a regiment together, they, they put them in one place for another time, and you got to do, you got to get a sanitation and all this stuff, and this, a lot of fellows got to say. I think I am going to tell you what our rations are. This, this is like a kid ready for camp, you know. Uh, we get bacon, salt, beef, salt pork, fresh beef twice a week, beans, peas, sometimes potatoes, dried apples, coffee, sugar, this is right, tea, vinegar, molasses. Our bread is the sea biscuit, or sea bread. Twelve of them for a man and a day. I must be talking about hard cat here. Horrible chunk of stuff which you really couldn't eat, you had to boil like a coffee. Um, sometimes we get bread made of Washington and sent on on the boat to Alexandria, then they put it in cars, take it to stations, blah, blah, blah. They actually in Washington, they, they did create great ovens and they did give warm bread to the troops who were down south. So the battle was not far from Washington, D.C. It was all very close. Um, so his letters go on. His letters go on. You know, he talks about the, the battle of Bull Run, the second Bull Run. And there's some great lines of this William Perkins thing, and he describes some of these battles. Describes the 26. He has a real good description of the second bail of Bull Run. He talks about Captain Palmer, who made a stand with five men. Uh, this must have been a bow, I figured, was the second bail of Bull Run. There was a terrible mass of the 26 retreated, and decimated, and, and uh, but he was with his Captain Palmer, it was his company. He must have made a stand at some point. He talks about the draft. You know, in 1863, they were, they were, they were in need of men because their people weren't volunteering as quickly, so they thought, oh, we're going to bounty. And uh, there's, there's a lot of things that come through talking about bounty, you know, you're a $190 for each soldier. Bowen is not too pleased with the way the North is handling themselves. So at least they would have enlisted quicker. Uh, I don't want to raise any skeletons in anybody's closet, but. Uh, their Captain Healy comes out again in the Clinton Courier. And, and any more, we're going to have problems with people not wanting to serve in the forces for whatever reason. And uh, a lot of guys quit to Canada in the Civil War to avoid serving. Um, there's a letter to the Courier. I've got to read this. This is, this is fascinating. 1862. Again, if I hope nobody knows these people. Like that. Uh, here's a letter that's written by Colonel Healy to the paper. It would please me much if you would insert the following letter in your paper that I received from Corporal Henry Moore and Private George Cockle, both from the town of Marshall, who deserted my company last week. 